follower, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Now, 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul writes to young Timothy. Paul is in prison. He knows that he's going to be executed soon, and he wants to encourage his friend. He had left Timothy in Ephesus to encourage and lead the church, and Timothy had run into a few problems. Number one, the city of Ephesus would make Las Vegas look like the Millennial Kingdom. It was a filthy and perverted city. And so when somebody would give their life to Jesus Christ, the pool of the city was pulling them back into the evil that they once did in that community. There was ungodly behavior in the church. There was unbiblical teaching in the church. And true Christians were being threatened by the emperor of Rome with persecution. Uh, Timothy himself was battling some things in his own life, the battle for holiness and purity, and he was also constantly being attacked in his leadership. Timothy was feeling weak. He was feeling alone. Twenty-five times in this book, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, be strong. Timothy, endure. Timothy, persevere. Timothy, hang in there. Twenty-five times. Why? Because he knew that Timothy felt weak, that he felt powerless, that he felt unloved, that he was second-guessing his role as a spiritual leader in the church. No wonder when Paul started this letter, he said to Timothy, Timothy, God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but he's given you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm sure Timothy was asking himself, how can I maintain a Christian witness in the world in which I live. And I'm sure we as a church ask the same question. How can we as a church maintain a Christian witness in the world in which we live? You know, if we were honest and we took the time to describe our Christian walk and we just wanted to use two words, we might say, I think my Christian life walk is described by weakness. Or my Christian walk, I feel all alone. I think there's a majority of God's people that feel as if they uh, are not walking the way they should with God, that there's a weakness there. There's a sense of being alone when it comes to our walk with God. That's where Timothy was, and Paul writes to him to give him a new perspective. And he uses three metaphors and we're going to learn from those metaphors because they describe our Christian walk. And the first metaphor he uses is the word soldier. Listen to verse, verses 3 and 4. He says, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. The first thing I want you to realize is that you're in a battle. You know, many Christians uh, are defeated because they forget that they are in a spiritual war. They forget that they have an enemy. They forget that there's a target on their back and on their chest. And they forget that there's a war going on that is attacking them to, def to make them ineffective for the cause of Christ as they fish for men and women who need to know Jesus Christ. Paul writes to Timothy and to us, and he says, you know, a soldier has to endure hardships. We're at war. You can't quit. Too much at stake. You know, I want you to imagine a, a soldier who has just come out of basic training. He's now sent off to the, the, the front, and he is on the front lines and suddenly he's being shot out and he runs back to his commanding officer and he says to his commanding officer, those people on the other side, they're not very nice. They're shooting at us. That's not right. The commanding officer would look at them and say, you got to be kidding me. They hate you. 
They want to kill you. You're at war. You know, once you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you engaged a new enemy. His name is Satan. I want to let you know he hates you. And he hates your heavenly father. But he can't get to God to hurt him. So he comes against you to hurt you because if he hurts you, he knows that hurts the father. And so he attacks. And we tend to ask questions like, why is our marriage in shambles? Or why don't our children walk with Jesus Christ? And why is it they're fighting going among God's people? And why do churches struggle so much? And the answer is we have an enemy. And he wants to hurt us. And he wants to make us ineffective for the cause of Jesus Christ. And when we forget that we're in a spiritual war, we will be defeated, we will get discouraged, we will be weakened, and we will feel as if we're all alone. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I love how Peter puts it. He says, Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion. I was trying to picture this, and I said, you know, hey, if, say I took you to a field, and it was a two-acre field, and then I put a fence around that two-acre field, and you were in it, and I told you, by the way, we also put a lion in there, and you began to hear the roar of the lion, what would your response be? That's right, you would run as fast as you could to that fence, you'd climb that fence, and get on the other side. But let's just say it was you and your neighbor and your co-worker were all inside of that field and the roar of the lion came. Not only would you want to run for the fence, but you would want to make sure that your neighbor and your co-worker were running for the fence and climbing that fence. You would do everything you could to get all of you outside where you would be safe from the enemy. Well, Satan is like that roaring lion. He's, he seeks to mess with your life your marriages, your families. And if he can mess enough with you, you'll begin to feel that you're not capable of helping anyone else escape from that kingdom of darkness that Satan rules into the kingdom of light, which is ruled by Jesus Christ. I'm always amazed at myself how easy it is for me to forget that I am at war. To forget that there is an enemy who doesn't like me. And I start saying things like, I don't know why this is going on. I don't know why everything is going against me. <laughs> when you begin to say things like that, you need to stop and remember, well, I got, wait a second, I got an enemy. I got an enemy and he wants to mess with me. The devil and his demons are against us, and they want to get you away from God's purpose for your life. So you say, well, what should I do? Well, don't fall for the devil's schemes. Use the uh, military analogy. Once you enlist in the military, uh, someone will tell you what to do. Uh, where to go, when to go, how to do it. Very quickly, you'll discover that you're no longer involved in civilian affairs. The only thing on your mind is being a soldier and pleasing your commanding officer because you don't want him being against you. Spiritually, some people think that the enemy's schemes are Maybe to take you down morally by a prostitute or take you down with drugs. He does that sometimes, but I think his scheme is really to get our money and our time so tied up in this world's stuff that we're useless to God's kingdom. Because when our entire focus is on our possessions and our vacations and our school activities and our bills, then God is secondary in our focus. 
And when God is secondary in our focus, Satan smiles. Because he knows then that he, do, he knows that we're not really focused on eternal things that God wants us to be focused on. He knows that we're no longer seeing the big picture. He knows that we're no longer seeing that we're in a battle for the souls of men and women. And if we forget that big picture, then guess where we're not fighting? We're not on the front lines. And if we're not on the front lines, we're going to be more like a wounded soldier. And a wounded soldier isn't out there fighting. He's injured, he's defeated, he's discouraged, he's weakened, and he's not freeing people from the enemy. If we feel alone, if we feel hated, if we feel like we're weak, it's probably because we've forgotten that we're in a war against an enemy who hates us. And secondly, it's because we fall into the enemy's schemes and we've lost sight of the big picture. A soldier also follows a set of different commands. He seeks to please his commanding officer. If the commander sent word to his troops, soldiers were moving out, and the soldier's response was, nah. Now, we're comfortable right where we are. We, we, we're dug in. We're playing cards. Uh, we like it where we're at. Uh, we're not moving. We're staying put. That would be absurd in the military. You wouldn't get away with that. The military understands the chain of command. It comes from the top down. Spiritually, when our commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaks, why is it that we choose to throw out the things we don't like and think we're going to get away with it? Think about it. In this book, there are lots of promises. There's lots of principles. Uh, like, for instance, let's, let's take this one thing that the Bible says. Uh, God will richly provide for us with all things to enjoy. You like that? You ought to circle that one, okay? So we flip over a few more pages, and we found a, another verse in the Scriptures, and it says, uh, I, I know the plans I have for you. I will not harm you. I will make you prosper and successful. You know, I like that one. I think I'll make that my life verse. Okay, I like that one. Let's find out what the Bible has to say about money. Ah, here it says, you've got to live and give generously. Nah, I don't like that. And if I'm supposed to prosper God, how am I supposed to prosper by giving my money away? What's he say about morality? Oh, okay. Live pure and holy. Oh, that's archaic. We do that, don't we? We take the verses that we like and we say, I'm going to circle that, I'm going to make them my life verse. And the verses that we don't like, we come up with an excuse why we shouldn't do it. You cannot please the Lord if you ignore his commands. And God's people will live defeated, weak spiritually, and will feel all alone if we forget we're in a battle if we get caught up in the enemy's schemes, and if we don't listen to our commanding officer to please him. Now, please understand this next statement. God is not your advisor. He is God. Okay? The second metaphor that Paul uses is this. In verse 5, he says, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. If we play on God's team, we got to play by God's rules. In Rome, in order to compete in the athletic games, there were three rules. You had to be a natural-born Greek... You had to prepare for 10 months before the games and swear before Zeus that you had prepared for 10 months 
And if they found out that you had not prepared for 10 months, you were killed. And the third one was that you had to stay within the rules of that particular event. Spiritually, for us, if we're going to gain the prize, if we're not going to be disqualified from the rewards that God desires to give us, we must be truly born again of the Spirit of God. That means we're followers of Christ. We're going to have to practice some self-denial, which means we've got to give ourselves over to spiritual training. And we've got to play by the rules. The Apostle Paul, as he was coming to the very end of his life, knew that he had accomplished everything God wanted him to. And he said, I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. And there is a crown of righteousness that God is going to give me. He knew he would receive the rewards from God. You know, I want you to go to a, in your mind to a track, and maybe at a high school, a 440, a 400 meters. And you're on the track team, and you run the 220. You all know what the 220 is. Halfway around the track, okay? And it's not just a straight line. You have to go down. You've got to go around the bend. You've got to come back. And, and you're all prepped and ready to go. You're going to run that 220. And uh, as the gun goes off, everybody comes out of, the sh- out of the block right away. And you sit back and say, I'm not going to run all the way down and around and all the way back to the finish line. I'm just going to cut across the field to the finish line and cross the finish line. And so you're running down about 20 yards, and then you cut across the field, and you get to the finish line, you cross the finish line, you throw your arms up in victory. Guess what? No prize. No prize. And you sit back and say, well, wait a second. I finished. I finished first. And they say, well, you cheated. And the crowd's booing, and you're disqualified, and there's no trophy. Do you know, we get that, don't we? We understand that. You didn't play by the rules, you don't get the trophy. Spiritually. Why, when it comes to the things of God, don't we get this? Why is it that we think that we can play by the rules some of the time and ignore the rules some of the other times And things will just be okay. That God is loving and God is forgiving and everything's going to be okay. And I'm going to get the prize anyway. Paul says, if you don't play by the rules, you don't get the prize. You know, if you never play by the rules, never, ever, ever pray by the rules, I want to let you know something. You're not on the team. Let's just say um, a guy walks into the church right now. I don't see him, but you have to imagine he's there. And he's dressed fully as a Philadelphia Eagle. Man, he's got the cleats on. He's got the football pants on. He's got the pads in the front, the pads on the side. And he's got the shoulder pads on. And he's got the shirt over top the shoulder pads. And he's got the helmet on his head. And he stands six foot four, weighs 286 pounds. He looks like a stud man. He's ready to go. And you go up and say, are you a Philadelphia Eagle? He says, yeah. He said, uh, you look at your watch and you say, don't you have some place to be? You know, like one o'clock is kickoff. <laughs> you should be there. No, 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 I don't have any place to be. Well, don't you play the games? No. Oh, you're on the practice squad? No. Do you travel with the team? No. You say, come here. You may look like a Philadelphia Eagle. You may say you're a Philadelphia Eagle. But I want to let you know something. You're not on the team. You may be a fan, but you're not on the team. People, we may call ourselves Christians. We may sing the songs in the hymn book. We may go to church gatherings, but if we never, there's the word, never play by the rules, I'm sorry, you're not on the team. 
You may be a fan, you may be exploring, but you're not on the team until you give your life to Jesus Christ. And the evidence that you gave your life to Christ is you begin to play by the rules. Now, having said that, there are athletes on sports teams who at times cheat, right? They, they don't play by the rules. They take steroids or they performance-enhancing drugs. And in the record book, you'll find their name and what they did. And after their name, there'll be this little thing called an asteroid. Or an asterisk, rather, sorry. Not an asteroid. <laughs> Big asteroid next to name. <laughs> that would be not very nice. Little asterisk right next to their name. And at the bottom of the page, it says, bet on baseball. Or use steroids. Now, there are Christians who are on God's team who have stopped playing by the rules. They gave up for whatever reason. And when they cross the finish line and they stand before God and the books will be open, they'll find an asterisk next to their name. Disqualified from the rewards. People to receive the prize, you've got to play by the rules. You say, what are the rules? You find them in this book. You read it. You say, that's what I've got to do. And you begin to do it through the power of Jesus Christ. Paul uses one other metaphor. It's a metaphor of a farmer. Verse 6, it says, The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. You know, a real farmer is hardworking. He plows and he sows and he tends and he reaps. He does it early and he does it late. He fights the frost. He fights the heat. He fights too much rain. He fights too little rain. He fights the bugs. He fights the weeds. And he's fully dedicated to gaining that harvest. And he waits patiently. And one day, he gets the harvest. A farmer's life is marked by dedication and determination. Spiritually, believers need to see themselves as farmers. We've got to be willing to work hard in order to see the results and wait patiently for the success of the harvest. We ought to be individuals who are filled with anticipation of the joy of personal spiritual growth and the fruit of having a kingdom impact now in this life and in the future life when we go to see Jesus Christ. You know, a soldier is rewarded in victory. The athlete is rewarded in winning. The farmer is rewarded in tasting the fruit of the harvest. Spiritually, each and every one of us are concerned. We want a harvest of souls who grow strong in the Lord, who go on themselves to make a kingdom impact. Somebody will say, well, how do you make it happen? How do you find the strength? How do you make it happen? Listen to what Paul says in verses 8 to 13. Follow with me. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David? This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Paul says to us, let me remind you who you follow. You follow Jesus Christ. Let me remind you what he did. He died on the cross for your sins and rose again, proving that your sin had been taken care of in order to offer to us eternal salvation that is only found in Jesus Christ. 
For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, let me remind you of this. No matter how hard it is in this life, no matter how strict the rules may be, no matter how hard it is to get a harvest, no matter how long it is before the harvest comes, no matter how bad it gets in this life, this is as close to hell as you will ever get. Let me remind you of the big picture. One day, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. You say, how do we fight the battle and experience the victory? How do we run the race and get the prize? How do we persevere like a farmer and taste the fruit of the harvest? First, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says this. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Here's the point. Our strength comes from whose we are, not who we are. Our strength comes from whose we are, not who we are. We have to depend on the grace that comes from Christ and that alone. Our strength comes from him. And when we forget whose we are, we will fail. But when we keep reminding ourselves we belong to Christ, he died and rose again, that his Father has adopted us into his family, that the Father has given us the Holy Spirit to live within us, and that greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. As I remember those things, I will find my strength welling up inside, and I'll no longer feel alone. If you're here this morning and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you say, well, I don't belong to Christ yet. What you need to do is you need to say this to God. I know I'm a sinner. And I know Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And he paid the penalty of my sin. And I certainly want to spend eternity with you. And I know you're the only way to the Father. And right now I put my trust in Jesus Christ. And I choose to follow him as my risen Savior. We're going to sing a song in a minute, and if you've never trusted Christ, maybe during that song you could just sit back and say to God, today's the day. I'm all in. I accept Jesus. I'm a follower of Christ now.